see the movie Jerusalem. That's what it's about. Anyone who didn't pay rent was out. This is Rocky Street in Johannesburg, South Africa. It was once known as one of the most dangerous streets in the world, and it's still not a place where those living in Johannesburg's leafy suburbs would think about venturing. But it's a street like this, like many others in Johannesburg's inner city, that migrants from both South Africa and the rest of Africa call home. They come to the city for a host of reasons, to escape hostility back home or to find their fortune. Sadly, along the way, circumstance turns many of these migrants into economic hostages. Hundreds of thousands of Africans leave their home country every year in search of a better life. For many, South Africa's economic metropolis, Johannesburg, which generates some 16% of the country's wealth, is a place where dreams are made. Yeovil is a microcosm of the larger Johannesburg inner city migrant dilemma. The suburb has long been a haven for migrants who came from Europe after the Second World War and in the 1970s in search of a new life. Today, it's still a migrant community comprised of what is a very diverse and eclectic suburb of micro-communities from mainly Southern Africa, followed by Central and then West Africa. This food came from different parts of Africa. Like a Nigerian, like a Ghana, like a Cameroon, like Congo, like a Mozambique. And it's here at the ShopRite Wall in Yeovil where migrants come in droves to find a place to stay. They become victims of a rental system that for many turns dreams of wealth and stability into a living nightmare. This rental system is unique. It's characterized by extortion and slum lords. It's also a system where money talks. This is Vusi and AB. They don't want their real identity revealed because they came to the country illegally escaping a socio-economic crisis in South Africa's once flourishing neighbor, Zimbabwe. We met them at the ShopRite wall looking for a new place to stay. This would be the fifth time they've moved in a year. They share a small room on top of a building near Rocky Street. It's a geezer room. And they pay 1,500 rand a month for this. And how much do you expect to pay for um, the next place you're going to? Two of us. You can, if you get something like a thousand, it's okay. You can pay a thousand. Can't afford to pay that huge amount of rent without reliable source of income. See. Vusi and Abi's situation is bleak. They don't have formal employment or a prospect of any down the line. But their story is not uncommon. Renters living in Joburg's inner city can pay up to 2,600 rand a month for one room, usually with no ablution facilities, sometimes even without electricity. This is similar to a price of a well-maintained unit in some of Johannesburg's upmarket suburbs. In order for tenants to afford these rental prices, they are forced to share sometimes four to five people in a room. Foreigners are paying more for the same accommodation than South Africans, in part because they have to sublet, because they don't have the proper documents. And even if they do, landlords, banks, others are, are often unwilling to recognize those. The, the problems of housing in, in Yeovil are more or less a, a problem of the housing policy generally in South African cities, in that you don't have a, a sort of entry-level rental market. The housing policy has been very much about providing houses to people that they can own, or a, a, a private rental market that is usually out of, the, out of the reach of the poor. Since 1994, the South African government has supplied some 2.3 million housing units to around 11 million people. But there's still a shortfall of over 2 million. Analysis of national data by the Forced Migration Studies Program at Fitz University shows that just over 3% of South Africa's total 49 million population across border migrants. In Gauteng, the most migrant dense province in South Africa, between five and six percent are estimated to be migrants from other African countries. 
In comparison, almost 4 million South Africans in Gauteng are from other provinces in the country. This influx of international and South African migrants puts a serious strain on Johannesburg and its ability to build adequate housing. And it's suburbs near the city's central business district, like Yeovil, that bear the brunt, offering an alternative for those who often don't qualify for state-supplied housing units. Because we have such a, such a big problem with housing in South Africa, um, there's a, a lot of demand for the lower type properties, but there's also a ceiling to which um, the, the potential owners can afford. Um, Yeovil specifically has, has the, the right type of property for the more affordable segment. Demand for Yeovil's property also boils down to other factors, one being that it's a largely informal system. A refugee or even an illegal migrant will always find a place to stay in Yeovil or Johannesburg's inner city. If you can pay the right price, you won't be asked questions. This also means that there is no form of recourse for either party. Even if renters wanted to complain, they'd find it hard to locate the owner of the building, who is usually overseas or linked to a trust of some sort. Or more likely, the building has been hijacked. And the South African government calls these bad buildings. And it's only now, through an information gathering campaign, that the government has confirmed that there are literally hundreds of bad buildings in Johannesburg's inner city. We are using a block by block system because, I mean, the, the inner city is too big, it's a huge elephant, we must eat it bit by bit. For currently, we have, we have identified four blocks. Uh, there's one block in Berea, one block, uh, one block in Berea, sorry, one block in Hilbro, and about two blocks in the Jubed Park area. But we have added another block in the Jeepers Town area. In those particular blocks, we have gone through about more than 400 buildings in those particular blocks. We have arrested more than 200 people out of those buildings. These are buildings, as I said, that have been abandoned. Um, they were previous um, office accommodation. They would have one toilet per floor, let's say, and um, opportunistic individuals have come in, hijacked certain buildings, they've taken them over, and, and then they've really preyed on, on people who are desperate for accommodation. Some of those people are really paying, although maybe not market-related prices or you know, what they're paying in terms of uh, uh, rentals, but they are paying something. I mean, uh, some of them they pay between 800 to 2,500. So it means that in some instances, we find that these people are paying to some you know, unscrupulous you know, landlords and who are you know, faceless. This microeconomic phenomenon didn't happen by chance. Will you please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. When South Africa was celebrating the dawn of a new era of democracy, migrants from all over Africa flooded Johannesburg for work. Up until the 1990s, it was a very Jewish community. In the 1980s, there was a, quite a marked shift happening in Johannesburg where the, the CBD, Jabert Park, Hillbrow, Berea, Yeovil, which had been the place to live because they were so close to the CBD, began to lose some of their attraction because they were, Johannesburg was beginning to suburbanize. So you had the development of suburbs on the periphery of Johannesburg. So in the 1980s, because of that, um, the government turned a blind eye to what they called the grey area phenomenon, which is that in spite of the Group Areas Act, coloured Indian and African people began to move into the city. Um, so that by 1990, uh, with the unbanning of uh, political organisations, the scrapping of the Group Areas Act, um, and of course after 1994 with democracy, uh, these became quite attractive places for the African community to live. So one of the consequences of that was that 1990 Johannesburg was 85% white. By 1998 it was over 90% black. The influx of migrant workers from South Africa, combined with cross-border migrants, caused property investors and owners to take flight. Scared of escalating crime, afraid 
of the unknown. They wanted to sell, but the banks weren't prepared to lend to anyone willing to buy. In a city of Johannesburg was comprehensively redlined up until, you know, 2004, 2005. I mean, the, the commercial banks were not lending downtown, not even on a home loan basis, or not much on a home loan basis, and certainly not on a commercial property finance basis. Rennie Plitt, whose dad just happened to be Mr. South Africa once upon a time, was one of the very, very few investors who saw an opportunity in the inner city when others were running from it. Uh, people were giving their buildings away and, and literally giving them away because they were burdens to them. In many cases, uh, they would give us the building in exchange for us to sell, settling up with council. Since the 1990s, the South African government has spent billions trying to revive the inner city. The Department of Human Settlement alone said at the end of last year it had spent 150 million rand to date on projects to refurbish dilapidated buildings. While there have certainly been visible changes to the city, it's hijacked buildings and slumlords that pose the biggest risk to Rennie's business. I think the biggest problem we face at the moment is the slumlords and the building hijackers. We're faced with such a shortage of housing mm -hmm. and also we have a shortage of housing in that we, from the private sector we're only able to deal with people that are earning typically on our market from three and a half to ten thousand rand a month. Now the problem is a lot of the population in Johannesburg, and I was saying the tens of thousands, are probably earning somewhere between probably fifteen hundred and the three and a half thousand rand a month. And the problem is where do they stay because the private sector can't assist them. They are people who externalised costs of ownership. They would not pay for just the basics like building safety standards, making sure that fire equipment's in place, lifts worked, fire escapes work. They're a problem because it's difficult to compete with them if you're a legitimate investor simply because these guys are making so much money by externalising all these costs that in order to make an offer that makes it worth their while, you have to pay above market prices. Rennie's company owns around 5,500 buildings in Johannesburg's inner city. Its focus is to provide accommodation for the influx of the country's fast-growing young black middle class who work in the city. At the same time, around 40% of his tenants are foreigners. We, we've had a policy that we only let to permanent residents or South African citizens. We're busy reviewing that at the moment, but it creates a lot of credit risk for us because if you have someone on a temporary status of, say, a three-month refugee permit, you know, we, we can't sign a six-month lease with them because we're not if they're going to be around after three months, they might be forced to leave the country. And also in terms of the Rental Housing Act, uh, we're not allowed to rent to a person that's illegally in the country. We to, it's a criminal offence. While some property investors have benefited from getting into the inner city property game early, the question is, are there still profits to be made? And what does this mean for the future of Yeovil? And what role do cross-border migrants play in the economic rejuvenation of Johannesburg? Find out after this.